dark and snowing heavily as Marley followed Cratchit and Son along the cheery streets filled with festive charity. Here, the young couple inviting a solitary widow to look upon their new baby and listening intently to her stories of her own family. There, children competing to be the first to grant a wassail choir a penny. Here again, a group of happily chattering ladies stood, all hooded and fur-booted, with a canteen of hot soup to furnish those with nothing, with a steaming cup of something to see them through the night. As the happy trio approached a house, a rather ramshackle two-up, two-down affair in Camden Town, Marley saw the gigantic figure of Sir Simon stooped and looking into one of the windows, with Scrooge at his side peering in at a similar fashion. Marley cursed his luck, for he was rather enjoying the company of the man and the child. Both had a quick wit and were excellent at discourse. At one point, Tim, for Tim was the name of the smaller of the two Cratchits, had invented a great story about penguins in the new London Zoo holding a skating party for Christmas, at which both him and the father had laughed heartily. Cratchit and son entered the very building that Scrooge and Sir Simon were spying upon. Marley supposed it made sense that the spirits would bring Scrooge to the door of his employee to learn about his effect on their lives. He pondered, though, on the coincidence of this. Was a higher hand guiding not only Scrooge's journey, but also his own? How could that be? And what could they hope to achieve by such an intervention? Marley knew that his account was closed to any more entries and the balance on the sheet could not be altered to his credit in the slightest. It was as he was ruminating on this that Sir Simon spied him from his place by the window. Come here and know me better, man, he bellowed from across the street. Scrooge looked up at him as if the phrase was one he was rapidly growing tired of and then took his attention back to the window. Marley scooted across the roadway, his chains wrapped in his hands like a bustling washerwoman. Ah, <laughs> there you are, little man, bellowed Sir Simon as quietly as he could. Come, take your rightful place in the puppetry. Marley gathered up the hem of Sir Simon's robe and made to go inside. Though still a giant, Sir Simon had dwindled and aged. His skin had become lined and his full black beard had started to take on a salt and pepper aspect. Spirit, are you quite well, he whispered, taking up his place in the pocket once more between the two malevolent puppets. Never better, boomed Sir Simon, although oh, I could have done without the interminable games of charades and that terrible prig in a top hat at a last stop. This made no sense to Marley, although Scrooge reacted. Will you kindly desist in pulling apart my nephew and his company, sir, he said. They were perhaps not as courteous to my person as they may have been, but in their defence, I have not always shown them kindness, so that will change. Yes, so I'll thank you to keep a civil tongue in your head when you're talking about my family and allow me to look upon these poor pe Bob Cratchit! This last report was in response to seeing his employee in the middle of the knot of thronging children. Marley snuggled down into the pocket, which was still just about large enough to accommodate him. He tried to make himself comfortable, but uh, he found that there was something in the next pocket along, digging into his back. He rummaged in it, and he found a book. Mm, one of the books from the Library of All Souls. He pulled it out. Its cover was scuffed and worn, and the number of pages contained within was pathetically small. Marley looked at the spine and saw the words, Timothy Robert Cratchit, etched into it. It was a book from the Library of All Souls. Marley looked at it. Was all this child's life so far contained within these pages? As the family settled down for Christmas dinner, Marley sat in the pocket and started to read. It was a short story, to be sure, beginning with the happy birth of Tim in December of 1837 and documenting the rise of the babe into the child with sparse prose and stark clarity. The illness that blighted this little life was noticed early and the family gave all they could to get a doctor to diagnose and treat the condition, but to no avail. 
Whether they'd been the victims of bad luck or of unscrupulous physicians, the text only hinted at. As the tale wound on, the illness grew worse and more debilitating. Yet, the more his affliction grew, the more wonder the lad found in the world. It was, it was as if he knew that his time was short and was determined to pack as much marvel into his allotted span as he could. Marley slowed his reading down to a crawl as he reached the present moment. The rector was his usual hellfire self, yet Tim did not take on. He knew that there must be some reason for the good man to sermonize in such a way. On the way home, Tim was in great pain from the cold, but did not wish to show his loving father weakness. Nevertheless, he was grateful for the offer of being carried the last few streets home. And then, they were precisely at now. Marley watched as the moments of the current Christmas feast were being overwritten with ink, after which there were just faint lines of pencil in the book and a spare dozen pages left. He flicked to the last page and saw faintly written, and finally, falling into a swoon from which he could not recover, it was on the 23rd of April, 1844, that Timothy Robert Cratchit died. A sad, a little death, as the old city ever knew. Marley rubbed his eyes. He willed the words to change. They did, but in no measure by enough for his taste. And after calling out in pain the whole night, with his mother by his side, it was on the 23rd of April, 1844, that Timothy Robert Cratchit died. What a waste of a good life was this, thought Marley. How could it be that the likes of himself and Scrooge could live to a ripe old age while this child was condemned to die so early? How could this, in any case, be seen as fair? He flicked back to the current page being written and saw the inexorable flow of ink pinning down each moment and preserving it forever. How he wished he could slow the passage of that invisible pen to set the unfeeling scribe onto another task, to let the boy alone for a spell, to, to modify the size of writing, to make it so that each page could hold a year rather than mere days. As he watched, the boy spoke. He both saw the dialogue appear in the book and heard its echo. God bless us, everyone, said the child. And it was obvious by everyone he meant not only the foregathered, but all souls who knew him within his little world. Marley hoped that that wish extended to himself. He vowed that once he was back to his normal haunting duties, he would do what little he could to ease the last moments of the boy's time, even if it were to sit vigil by his side. Will the child live? Marley heard Scrooge's voice inquiring for Sir Simon. Um, I'm sure that, uh, given a good wind, Sir Simon stuttered, um, know me better, man. Marley snapped the book shut and thumped it as hard as he could against the steed's leg. Scrooge couldn't be let off the hook because some silly shade couldn't retain his script. No, he hissed, the child will die. Sir Simon spluttered again and muttered something about an empty chair at the table next year. Say it, Marley hissed as quietly as he could, her hoping that his charge could hear him. But don't flower it up with verbiage, just say it. Let the stupid old fool know the truth, the child dies, tell him. Sir Simon did as he was bidden and Scrooge seemed to quiet and take it in for a moment. Marley sighed. Who was that? asked Scrooge. What was that sound? I heard a voice. Show me the inside of your robe. Now, Marley would have dearly loved to have confronted Scrooge. This ghost of Christmas present was not likely to affect him in the slightest, for all his thunderous tones and great stature. Marley thought that he may have had a chance. His rage was hot enough, but he also knew that were Scrooge to see Marley in this undignified position, any entreaties made by himself would be likely met with hilarity. Scrooge, though, would not be put off. There's someone under there. Show me. Then Marley remembered 
that the shade had said that he would have something to do with a performance using puppets. This robe made a perfect little stage area. If Scrooge wanted to find someone hidden away, then he would. Marley grabbed for the strings and controllers of the two marionettes either side of him, the wolfish boy and the haunted girl. He, he pulled them out of the pockets and let them slam down onto the floor. The sound had the desired effect on Scrooge. What was that? he cried. Marley moved the hand of the male puppet and let the fingertips just peep out from under the robe. Scrooge gasped and Marley worked the strings so that the puppet slowly drew back the robe to reveal the scene. The puppet was surprisingly responsive. A pluck on a string here and the eyes flickered. A pull on that string there and the legs straightened until the puppet was stood at its full height. Sir Simon took his cue and kept the robe open and the show began. Marley poured all his anger into the little wooden facsimiles. He imbued the boy with a spirit of benightedness. It danced around, coins spilling out of its pocket and rolling away. The other figure, the girl, Marley, left prostrate for quite some time. It even had to endure some blows from the boy in its careless dance. All she did was tremble. The boy stopped its wild movement suddenly and checked its pockets. Finding all its coins had gone, Marley made the boy kneel in front of Sir Simon, its hands together in a gesture of supplication. Marley plucked a string and the boy's leg lashed out and kicked the girl in the ribs sharply. It was at this point that Marley allowed the figure of the girl some little movement. She edged her face out a little and gingerly put out one hand in a similar gesture to the boy's. Spirit, are they yours? said Scrooge. Um, well, they're some man's, said Sir Simon in a distracted manner, then winced as if he'd been thumped in the leg. Sir Simon fished about in his pockets and found two silver coins. He gave one each to the two figures. They cling to me, appealing from their fathers. The male puppet lifted its coin to his eyes and then suddenly jammed it into his mouth and swallowed it greedily down into its wooden stomach. It then swung round on the girl, snatched the coin out of her hand and gobbled that down also. Who are they? asked Scrooge. Well, um, said Sir Simon. Ignorance and want, muttered Marley. He pulled the strings feverishly. Now the boy was indicating that the money was gone and he was making gestures as if to blame the girl for this predicament. This boy is ignorance. Marley made the figure of the boy slap the girl. She put her hand out to stop him, but the boy turned the palm of her hand upward and then looked up at Sir Simon. This girl is want. Beware them both and all of their degree, but most of all, beware this boy, for on his brow I see that which is written, which is doom. Sir Simon let the edges of the robe down once more as the boy held his hand aloft, either in a gesture of begging or as a precursor to another beating. The darkness enveloped Marley and the puppets entirely, and he drew them up and carefully placed them back into their allotted pockets. Marley heard Scrooge once more remonstrating with the spirit that the world was not fair, that this should not be. Still, he does not understand, thought Marley. He doesn't recognise himself in the boy. It got darker and darker in the robe. A shadow that had the silhouette of the unrevenged king loomed over him in the darkness. Heed me, Ebenezer, cried Marley as the gloom overtook them.